Kids. I just woke up from a nap I took in January of 2020, and boy are my arms tired. Let's see what I missed. Hmm. Queen's dead, war in Ukraine, the Taliban's back. What? What is... Holy shit. They made a movie called Scoob. Unprecedented global pandemic, Space Jam 2, some popular guy named Brandon. Yep, that just about covers it. Anyway, we all know about the scientific names of animals, but did you ever wonder what they actually mean? To find out, we must look to taxonomists. They're the guys responsible for the systems of nomenclature we use to classify organisms. And boy, are they convoluted. First, you got the big A, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. I've seen plenty of mnemonic devices for this, but since the D just showed up in the 90s and is still disputed by some scientists, he's usually not included. So allow me to suggest a few. Dizzy kids puke cereal on fairground staff. Dumb kittens pushing cups over feeds growing spite. Donkey Kong's p c oh, fucking c serendipitously. The way this whole thing works differs slightly depending on which kingdom you pick. So today we'll be sticking to the animal one, cause that one's the coolest and I'm in it. So what constitutes each taxon is pretty arbitrary, they basically just serve to act as another set of branches in the tree that taxonomists build. The one exception is species, which is generally defined as any group of animals that can have babies with each other that aren't sterile freaks. Mule, Liger, Zedonk, Skunk Ape, they can live fulfilling lives, but they're all shooting blanks so they don't count. On the other hand, in our innumerable trespasses against God, we can make things like Chidane Danes, which actually work, so dogs are dogs are dogs. Besides species though, it's the Wild West in here. Plenty of times, eight tiers isn't even enough for scientists, so they just stick new sub-levels in between. Legions, cohorts, tribes, series, divisions, and if you want to keep going, you can throw all kinds of prefixes on any of these for even more layers. There's even subspecies, which the more pedantic of you may think to yourselves that creating names for subspecies at all kind of undermines the single somewhat agreed upon definition in the whole tree. To that, my friends, taxonomy say, uh. But while that's pretty complex, the actual names themselves are pretty easy to wrap your head around. Though taxonomists may hide behind their fancy Greek and Latin, the Vulgate is no substitute for wit. Now, I've scraped through the scientific names of a load of species, and most of them can be split into a few categories. The simplest ones are the animals that already have names in Greek or Latin. It's a lion, I'm calling it Leo. Done. Tiger, it's a tigris. Cat, it's a caddis. Easy. Multi-word names can be translated the same way. For the golden eagle, we got Aquila chrysatos. Gold eagle eagle. They decided to be a show off and do eagle in Greek and Latin, essentially the same though. But if a species is too specific or exotic for a one-to-one -one translation, that's when you gotta get a little creative. A lot of the time, inspiration comes from just giving the creature the old once-over and pointing out some cool-looking body part. Generally, the more distinct of an identifying feature it is, the more likely it'll get in the name. For example, Homeboy took one look at this thing and said, yup. Red triangle slug, I'm going on break. We call this thing a fucking unicorn, almost like that means one horn or something. Also, some guy deadass looked at an octopus and said, well, all they got is heads and feet, I'ma call them head foot. And now biologists everywhere say cephalopod unironically. Matter of fact, if it's got feet, chances are that's part of its name somewhere. You got four feet, six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, two feet, equal feet, both feet, double feet, stomach feet, lip feet, sucker feet, wing feet, big feet, slow feet, or feet, both feet, joint feet, no feet, 10,000 Feet, cow's feet, spade feet, cat feet, small feet. If it doesn't look that interesting, another thing to point out is where you found it. This could be a territory like American bear or Siamese crocodile, or just a habitat like woods macaque or toilet rat. But that's boring. We need to look at the men behind the magic and what drives and motivates them. Now, if there's one thing that the scientific community loves, it's clout. And there's no better way to go down in history than plastering your own name on some shit you found. But not all fields have the same volume of things to scribble the old John Hancock over. On the one end, you got physicists just making up their own slightly different form of ionizing radiation measurement. And even then, only the top dogs got away with it. Now, zoology, any little goober flouncing through the underbrush can say, this one has 13 spots, but the one in the book's only got 11. I will call him Splinkus's Ladybird. Alternatively, plenty of biologists have given shout outs to their contemporaries, both other biologists and those across the academic gamut, from geologists to physicists to explorers and more. Naturally, Darwin's got a shitload, but even the background characters get a mortal 
immortalized one way or another. Who are Thompson, Grant, Summering, Erlinger, Speak, and Cuvier? I don't know, but they've all got gazelles, so they must be pretty cool. Of course, other times, the name checks go to people who had fuck all to do with anything except for one taxonomist being a fan of theirs. Plenty of popular celebrities have species named after them, but since all the big cute stuff was found and branded a while ago, most of these idols are commemorated through repulsive little invertebrates. You got Scaptia, Beyonce, -A. The only similarity I can gather here is Queen Bee, looks like a bee, both not a real bee. There's Anomphilus jagarius, an old stone named after an old stone. In 2007, one Jason Bond, a professor of biology at UC Davis, dubbed this little dude Myrmechiophila Neil Youngie to honor his favorite musician, which caused my man Stephen Colbert to go on TV and profess his utter indignation at not having a spider named after himself. So naturally, the next year, Bond actually went on the Colbert Report to announce the naming of Apostatus Stephen Colberry. So, <laughs> if that gives any of you epic biologists out there any ideas, you know, I wouldn't be opposed. Please, I would do anything. For the love of God, I'll even take a liking. The world of politics is by no means immune to this phenomenon. Obama alone has fucking nine, as do a load of other presidents. Trump's got a moth with funny hair, Bush has a fungus beetle, Reagan's a wasp, Carter's got a darter, and so forth. Even Austria's most famous painter got the honor through this blind cave beetle. Mind you, it was 1933, so you can only blame the guy a tiny bit. Hitler actually wrote him a letter saying, oh, thank you, my little entomalo mensch, and then went on to do, you know, Hitler things. Fun fact, not only was this beetle stuck with just about the worst name you could have, it's also now facing extinction solely because of its value to Nazi memorabilia collectors. Guess old habits die hard. Oop, fictional characters have their fair share of species under their belt. On the topic of evil beetles, this one's named after Darth Vader because he kind of looks like his helmet, I guess. This was actually named by the same guy who did the bush one and belongs to the same genus. Hmm. There's also this mite, genus Darth Vaderum, which is a lot more accurate and frightening. In 2012, a single bone from above the eye socket of a hitherto unidentified theropod dinosaur was being studied. And suddenly, under the light of the full moon, the guy working with the specimen had his neck covered with hair and his lips clenched into a pog and his endocrine system filled with Soy, and he said, it's just like the eye of Sauron. And then he started chewing on Funko Pops and sweating cream of meme and snorting G Fuel and shitting D20s everywhere until the prostate stimulation made him. The dino's genus is now Sauroniops from Eye of Sauron. This spider was named after Godric Gryffindor because it looks like the sorting hat. SpongeBob has not a sponge, but a fungus. The legendary birds from Pokemon each have their own. You guessed it, beetle. And the list goes on. <laughs> Scientists are nerds. Who knew? Anyway, while this all seems kind of chaotic, there is some method to the madness. One rule is the principle of priority. This states that once somebody publishes their chosen name for a species for the first time, that's the name, and other taxonomists typically can't change it. This has led to plenty of misnomers coined by whoever got their foot in the door first, particularly in the case of the guys doing this stuff before we had the luxury of genetic analysis. Here's one. Red panda? Nah. Shining cat. Coined in 1825. To be fair, they're actually about as close to cats as they are to actual pandas, so so whatever. Here's two. Capsicum chinense. Eaten there? Sure. Native? Only off by around half a globe, where literally all hot peppers came from. This principle holds true even if someone thinks they've found a new species, only to later discover that it was already named. For example, in 1824, one John Edward Gray documented the plain zebra, calling it Equus burchellii, or Birchell's horse, named after a renowned naturalist of the day. Little did he know, back in 1785, some other douche classified this character as the quagga. The last quagga died in a Dutch prison in 1883. So, why do we care? Well, in the 2000s, scientists decided to scrape some gunk off a dry quagga pelt and study its DNA. And from that they realized, wait a minute, apparently this guy and zebras could have, you know, made a little plaid in the hay together. So technically they're one species. And today they're both called quagga. Sounds kind of asinine, but then again so does asinus, and that worked out fine. Just to maintain the distinction, the extinct subspecies was renamed quagga quagga, so you know it's the real quagga. This double naming convention has been done with a lot of subspecies in fact. Wild wild horse, Spotted Spotted Panther, or my favorite, Gorilla Gorilla Gorilla. Just like, yeah, it's the gorillas gorilla that ever gorilled. Fuck you want from me. A closely related rule also states that the names of all taxa have to be unique. So if two people coincidentally name any taxa on the same thing, the older one gets to stay and the new one gets the boot. Like if you saw a genus called Echidna, you'd think it was, you know, an Echidna, right? Well, no, that'd make too much sense. For a while it was true, from 1797 to 1811. Then it was pointed out that someone else already called a genus of moray eels Echidna back in 1788. So the real echidna had to be changed to tachyglossus, or quick tongue. Then a decade later, a dude did the same thing for a genus of vipers. Another 22 years passed, people discovered the same thing, and they were renamed to bitis, cause they bitis. That one at least made a bit of sense, given that the original echidna from Greek mythology was half lady, half snake, but who cares at this point. Anyway, I've just barely scraped the surface of all the goofy names out there, so feel free to post more down below. That's all I've got for now. Till next time, I'm Salmonella, and I'll see ya in 2025.
Don't say it, don't think it, don't say it, don't think it.